What is your name? Joe Kirschwink. All right, and uh, are, you an ex are you an earth scientist, an astronomer? Or? I'm not sure. Okay. <clears throat> I'm something about uh, between a geophysical neurobiologist. Geophysical neurobiologist. Okay. And uh, are we alone in the universe? When I wake up in the morning, I'm not alone. <clears throat> but the question I assume you mean, is Earth life alone in the universe? That's the one version of it, yes. I, <clears throat> I sort of doubt it. Too many planets out there, too many things uh, <clears throat> orbiting other stars, too many other places. However, I am a fan of something called the Medea hypothesis that basically says um, life couldn't give a damn about what it does on a planet. We see examples of this in Earth history. Um, snowball Earth events, the biggest one that we know of is probably McEnany. Think it was triggered directly by the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis. Damn near killed the planet. If we'd been just a little bit further from the sun, that snowball would have allowed carbon dioxide to freeze out at the pole. But when Medea killed her children on purpose, not by accident, and this presumably is an accident. A life couldn't give a damn <laughs> about the fate of the planet. Uh, so this is like an anti-Gaian model? Uh, totally. totally. Uh, Peter Ward has written an entire book on the Medea hypothesis. Right, right. And, and this is one of the examples in that. Okay, uh, so, so what you're saying is that life could be everywhere, but it surely doesn't regulate the planet and help its own persistence. <clears throat> we're here uh, because we're lucky. We're here because we're lucky. Okay, so on other planets with other life, they're not as lucky, and so there are going to be a lot of dead, uh, a lot of planets with uh, fossils? <clears throat> Unfortunately so. Unfortunately. Yeah. Any idea about that? Now, whether or not we get life complex enough for animals or, is, a big deal, is a big deal. Uh, I'm also a fan of the rare earth hypothesis, uh, Warden Brownlee, mm -hmm. uh, that makes more and more sense the more we learn about the universe. Now, when you say rare earth, do you mean the, 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 the details of... Finding a planet in any particular galaxy that managed to reach an animal grade of evolution, going through the oxygen crisis, going through the multicellularity, things that you would need to do to get functional animals. An animal uh, grade, that sounds like the great chain of being, which most biologists probably would not subscribe to. Well, indeed. It, it, Earth may be a complete anomaly in the universe for that. Who knows? <clears throat> well, do you so. think that once life evolves, that it evolves in a direction of human-like intelligence and technology? No. And uh, wh what do you think? They can't give... Uh, life would not know any end game. We're looking back at it because we got here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, I can see billions of planets out there maybe with stromatolites. And they're very happy stromatolites. They're sitting there doing their thing. They know nothing else. So you think there are more planets with stromatolites <clears throat> than planets with telescopes? Absolutely. By a factor of a hundred, a billion, a trillion, a gazillion? Trillions, maybe. Trillions. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, if I gave you a hundred billion dollars with the caveat, you have to spend it to try to answer the question, are we alone? What would you spend it on? Influencing the next election. <laughs> What, explain the chain of reasoning there. <clears throat> well, uh, we have evolved to the point where we might prevent the next Median tragedy or cause it. Right. And if we want to <laughs> at least keep the number of planets with animal life at a minimum of one, we might want to invest those resources that way. Okay, so the idea is you, we should stay alive, invested in staying alive. <laughs> exactly. That's the number one prerequisite for finding extraterrestrials in the future. But it's not going to be done if we die. <laughs> that's right. That's, that seems like, and so <clears throat> you think the best way for, for you to influence the future of the planet and maintain our existence is to invest in a U.S. election? Is that what you said? It might be. Why not invest in the U.N., for example? <clears throat> well... You, you control the most dangerous part first. I <laughs> see. The most virulent disease. Okay. And that would be the U.S., uh, uncontrolled U.S. militarism or something. Okay. So that's how you'd spend all of your money? Would you spend 100% of it? Or couldn't, would you spend like 10% of it on some type of scientific well, endeavor? Well, certainly. <clears throat> I mean, there are other places in the solar system that are within the reach of human grasp. And we would like to be able to go and see it. Enceladus... Sounds like a beautiful target if we could go and drill. 
<clears throat> a colleague of mine had a very nice idea for uh, tunneling through um, ice casts around things like uh, Europa or Ganymede or whatever. <clears throat> you take two little half shells of uranium-235, mm -hmm. subcritical, put them together on the surface, massive radiation, heat melts straight down, sterilizing it as it goes so you don't contaminate it. And then you string cables along behind it and look. That's interesting. Why not just sit at the at the regions where it's coming apart, where you do well, get up? Well, in Enceladus, really? you can do that, except that you have a gas stream coming up. That'd be pretty things. If you actually melted the way through, nice thing is you could feed the cable from a spool on the uh, probe that's going down. The ice would reheal quickly. Like ice cube, the uh, neutrino detectors exactly. in Antarctica. Yeah, in, in other words, and, and you leave the cable in the ice behind it, uh -huh. so it doesn't end up with a plume in your face. Wait, but how, how deep do we have to melt? To 30 kilometers. 30 kilometers worth of okay. Well, that's why you use two little subspherical shells of uranium-235. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And, and it falls through, it once well, through the ice, it falls to the bottom and harms nobody. And how do you broadcast back to the Earth? Well, you would have a, a station on the top, and you have an optical fiber going up to the surface. And once it falls <clears> down, you still have an optical fiber. Well, no, you would, you would, leave, a, you would leave a microscope assembly set up there. Oh, like a receiver yeah. there. That of course, the, the most elegant solution to the is there life in Europa problem that I've ever heard of was one by Freeman Dyson you may know of. Uh, looking for fish on the surface. Well, no, in orbit. In orbit? Fish in orbit, okay. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and uh, so... Uh, well, I mean, every impact that goes in, would major impact, would splash bits of the European ocean out. Yes, yes. And uh, Freeman has a nice argument that the cost effectiveness measured by the probability of success, mm -hmm. success being able to detect life, <clears throat> um, looking at the junk in orbit around Jupiter, which may have been ejected from Europa, is an easy mission to do, technically. Okay? So th that's a very high probability of success. The probability of looking and finding life in that is low. Okay? But you multiply the two, yep. and it's, you get a number. Well, more difficult is to land on Europa, right. melt your way in, and look. Right, right, that's, right, right. that's a high probability of success if you actually get down there, but a low probability of being able to do it. Yes. The product is the same. Okay. But the cost is a lot less just to look in orbit. What do you think of the uh, star shot and the uh, SETI $100 million that Yuri Milner has given to both the, the SETI's upgrade and the star shot? <clears throat> I'm not sure what you would do with the little ounce-sized things that you get to another planet. Well, I, I mean, iPhones are getting very small quickly. Yeah, well, yeah, but you still have to get a radio signal back. Yes. And there are fundamental detection limits on what you can do with that. I see. So, and Phil okay. Lubin is not qualified to, to fix it? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I mean, I would rather uh, uh, put humans in the selenerate mode. And in selenerate the, mode? In the selenerate mode. What's that? That's where you, uh, <clears throat> uh, you have prodigious quantities of gametes, and you spread them I quickly. Spread them so quickly. you may as well, I mean, you don't know what's out there, but if you're going to send billions of things to another star system, make sure they're seeds. Okay, so you want to be the, the god of panspermia. Why not? And, and, okay, and when you say panspermia, do you mean sending out the DNA of uh, bacteria, or archaea, or of human beings? Well, <clears throat> you wouldn't want to do human beings because it's ridiculous, but what you would want to do is to have a system that is pre-adapted for extreme environments. Life is probably not going to evolve in an extreme but, environment. But what is our interest there unless we can identify with the, pre the successors of the things that you're sending out? Well, you'll never know. Never know, so why do it? Why not? Well, I guess because it's you're, fun. you're kind of colonizing without getting any of Sending the gold back Sending gametes out is fun. You I know, know this. but you're, you're not getting any of the gold back from South America. <clears throat> you don't send ships across the world to get lost without any prospect of them coming back and giving you gold <laughs> for profit for your investment. Well, we're not doing an investment here. We're rep re reproducing. We're spreading that's robust another, DNA. That's, a, that's another urge <laughs> of the biosphere. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, is the question, are we alone, an important one? Of course it's important. Why do you say that? If it turns out we're not alone, just think about the ramifications. If we're not alone and we can understand it, particularly what does it take to avoid catastrophe, to avoid becoming the end product of a Median biosphere, 
uh, that's extremely important. So you think we can learn from these omniscient, advanced aliens how not to destroy ourselves? It's like we're jumping out <clears> off a bridge well, and we want somebody to come and telephone us, hey, you don't, you don't need to make this decision right now. You can do it tomorrow or change your behavior. The investment to do that is minimal compared to the productivity of the planet. Okay, so you, let me ask you yeah, again. I may as well do it. Is, so is this question, are we alone, important? <laughs> yes. And not everybody agrees with you. A of lot of not. people think that, hey, what the hell, I'd rather get uh, some ice cream. I like ice cream, too. <laughs> okay. okay, but not as much as you'd like looking for an alien. <laughs> well, if I had a choice of giving a dime to look for an alien or giving a dime to go for the ice cream, I'd probably go for the ice cream uh -huh. first. Okay. But, you know, after 100 ice creams, I might throw a dime or two the other way. Now, you're, if I just ask the irrational side of your brain, the emotional side of your brain, what type of aliens would you like to find? The ones that won't harm us. Ones that won't harm you, ones that do no harm. Okay. Now, Arthur C. Clarke once said that uh, any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic. But there's a guy named Carl Schroeder who said, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. By that, I'm, I think he meant <coughs> that advanced no, technological no, civilizations no. become tree hugging, no, no, ecologically no. sustainable tech civilizations. A sufficiently advanced civilization will be invisible to us. Oh, so that's kind of like indistinguishable from dark energy then or something. They're not going to want to, maybe they don't want us to know about them either. Well, why would they care if they're so advanced? We don't care what amoebas think of us or see us or not. <clears throat> if there are nasty guys out there, <laughs> then maybe the ones that survive are the ones that don't. Well, Stephen Hawking has, has famously said we should keep our head down. We shouldn't send out signals, and we should uh, listen but not send out signals. What do you think of that? I'd rather send out seeds. Send out seeds. Okay, that's kind of a signal. Uh, we, I've had one astronomer who was a little bit like the generals in contact, and he said not only should we not listen, we, should, we shouldn't even no, not only should we not send signals, we shouldn't even listen, because if we listen, these messages will be constructed for, to make us make a machine that would kill us. Are you, are you, do you envision that as a plausible but possibly paranoid scenario? Or what level of paranoia would you associate with that? Uh, Extremely high paranoia. Extreme, okay, but you don't share that? Not really. So you want uh, to listen? Well, I mean, you prior, prior to Trump's election, I didn't share that. I didn't really think about that. Okay, so if you get, if we get a message, you, like uh, Jody Foster, would want to build the machine. Study the technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, building a machine blindly, without understanding it, does not make any sense. On the other hand, if you get a message of Jody Foster in contact or whatever, study the technology. Understand what's going on. Build your own technological infrastructure up to the point where you understand what that machine does mm. and then worry about it. And if you give, come to a point where you don't understand it, do some more homework. Do okay. your... in, at the end of that book, in the end of the movie, a uh, matter of fact, one of the themes that comes back is somebody says, uh, do you think there's life elsewhere? And Jodie Foster and her father and her boyfriend's response was, well, if there's no one out there, it's an awful waste of space. What do you think of that comment? Have you seen my lab manager cleaning up my lab? I have not. It was an awful waste of space. The, the lab manager, your lab? My lab. <laughs> your lab. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. How does that? How does that answer the question? It doesn't. But okay. it was a good dodge. Okay. Okay. All right. But now, there's a lot of space out there. Yeah, but is there? Would it, Would you consider it to be a waste of space <clears> if we do not find? I don't know. Intelligent, human-like, intelligent aliens. It is a series of places, particularly with stars that have appreciable asteroid belts around them. Why not do the Jerry O'Neill thing? And the what thing? The Gerald O'Neill oh. thing, the high frontier. So build gigantic superstructures and inhabit them. Why not? Well, but if you're in favor of like panspermia, you must think the, the universe without your sperm is a, a waste of space. But the most effective way of getting that sperm out there is to colonize space. And every 500 years, send a mission to another star system and let it grow exponentially. Okay, but the 10 million years, 
10 million years tops, we have the whole galaxy. I mean, isn't that great? But most Earth-like planets are older <clears throat> than this Earth. You don't need Earth-like planets. Wait, wait, wait. That. Most Earth-like planets are older than the Earth. Therefore, if what you envision of a technological civilization producing, it should have already happened two billion but years ago. it didn't, ago. therefore it's ours. It didn't. So what is your favorite solution to the Fermi paradox? That we're the first? <clears throat> I like that concept, yeah. The Fermi paradox is a good one. The simple solution is that we're zero, zero, 001. We're the first. If it is really that easy to colonize space, a la GK and the old, and <clears throat> if you just do the simple dynamics and you realize the immensity of geological time, the time scale for colonizing a galaxy is on the order of 10 to 100,000 years. To get in there, to really do it, mil 10 million years tops. There's 10 million, tell 10 me. Million years 10 tops. A million to 10 million. 10 million years tops, come on. Okay. Uh, I think O'Neill had 15 million years. Anyway, okay. But uh, uh, it's not, it, it, you know, and then that, that leads to the paradox. Sure, where are they? Right. So. And so we need a solution to it. And your favorite solution is? Do it. Your favorite solution is it hasn't been done, so we should do it. Yeah. I see. Okay. Now, you teach students, uh, I guess, in astrobiology, of some aspect of astrobiology. Now, is there any, uh, actually, is there any, uh, how does your research contribute to answering this question, are we alone, if at all? Well, <clears throat> um, identification of snowball Earth events certainly is one of the, mo it, it adds to the monkey wrenches that can make things go wrong. Do you think the other Earth-like planets that are in the, in the universe, they too have snowball episodes? They ought to. Is there anything, but you are a fan of the rare Earth, so is there <clears> anything <throat> yeah. special about the Earth that would produce only snowball Earths here and not on the other Earths? We were lucky that when we went into the snowball states, we got out of them. Well, why luck? I thought that was just to put if it back If Earth had been a little bit further away, that first snowball, which was triggered we really think by the <clears throat> sudden and unexpected invention of oxygenic photosynthesis, that first snowball would have been so hard and fast, we would have been Mars. In other words, the temperature at the poles would be enough to crystallize out CO2. So no matter how much carbon dioxide you outgas from the mantle, it would not go in the air, would not contribute to uh, greenhouse warming, it would crystallize into a glacier. Oh, wait, wait, wait. And, and therefore, we'd be in the snowball now. That's a I'm, permanent I'm, snowball event. I'm confused because you just said earlier you were a fan of Medea hypothesis. Yes. And then you just gave me an example of Earth producing oxygen to get us, to save us. Who produced the oxygen? Cyanobacteria. Life. That's, that's life. Yes, life. Life produced Cyanobacteria something. caused the worst di disaster on this planet. Yes, but it also saved everybody. No, it didn't. To, it didn't save anything. Didn't you say that oxygen no. was the thing that produced prevented us from going into a permanent snowball? No, 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 CO2. Oh, CO2. You see, but the, CO2. The, <clears throat> the thing is, the oxygenic photosynthesis happens on such a rapid time scale once that first, cyan the first cyanobacterium that can kick out an oxygen, oxygen molecule without dying from the peroxide radicals and things that come back. That can, it mean, you, it has the solution to the electron donor problem, which limited Productivity. But wait a minute, let's go so, back. To, no, no, let me, let me finish this. Okay. So the point is, as soon as that happens, you destabilize any planetary greenhouse you can imagine. If it's CO2, if it's methane, both of those go away. Okay? You plunge into wait, the wait, snowball that makes CO2 we see. go away? Yes. I didn't know because that. Because the biological productivity goes up. The Earth um, turns green. You suck down the CO2 and you bury it as a fixed carbon. So you light pump up the liquid. oxygen, but that has to have happened before you learned how to breathe the oxygen. So the remineralization, getting rid of that carbon, organic carbon and putting it back into CO2 where you can do a greenhouse buffer, that hadn't evolved yet. So you go, boom, you end up in the snowball. Mm -hmm. And if you're just a little bit further from the sun, it's a permanent death. A planet dies, it's any further CO2 that gets volcanically outgassed, crystallizes at the pole, and the planet dies. How much further? Eh, halfway to Mars. Halfway to Mars. Until, of course, the solar luminosity increases enough 
to get us out. But that's you know billions of years down. So you, you have an, you, you have a global interruption of primary productivity, potentially in, until the sun itself provides an escape. But when the sun provides that escape, you have so much carbon dioxide in the poles. You get out of the snowball. You put that CO2 in the atmosphere, plus the water vapor, you're going to run away greenhouse. How much of what so you, you just did. described is applicable to other Earth-like planets around other stars? Everything. So and if, if you're going to worry about getting to an animal grade evolution driven by the largest redox chains we have, oxygen down to hydrogen, then you need to have oxygen at photosynthesis. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it's not an easy system to do, by any means. Now, at uh, Caltech, where you teach, uh, what are the biggest misconceptions your students have about this question, are we alone? <clears throat> well, you know, the, the misconception would be that if they don't understand that it is a problem. If you realize that the problem of are we alone or not. Uh, if you don't think it's a big question, that's a problem. So can but, you, can but hey, this is Caltech. We got the best students on the planet. Trust me on this. <laughs> really, the best students. Okay. They have good brains. Okay. You know. If, and with their good brains, they're some, not all red-haired, but they have good brains. Okay. Right? So, so even with their good brains, some <clears> of them are not convinced that are we alone uh, is an important question. Everyone has their own important questions, but for those of us who study the history of the planet. It is, an, it is an important question. Okay, and uh, I mean, what, what we're talking about, I guess, is the scientific or the story of our genesis. And uh, do you, is that an important issue to understand where we came from? Because some people just couldn't care less where they've been born, you know. <clears throat> but uh, we're talking about where all of life came from. Now, many of us, you and I, think that's really important. It's interesting as heck. But other people say, I don't care. So is there a way that you have to inspire these people who don't care? You just say that. Damn help. near every religion that evolved on planet Earth strives to answer that question in one way or the other. A lot of people are not religious, though, even if they pretend to be. <laughs> it's still an important question. Okay. Whether you answer it with science tools or theological tools it makes a difference. I prefer the science mode because it's falsifiable. You can test things. You can understand things. Dogma is not something you can test and falsify. So, so do, you have, do you have any advice to budding young astrobiologists who, where, who are thinking about this question? Follow your interests. Question everything. Test everything. And then don't kill the planet. <laughs> Try not to kill the planet in the process, yeah. <laughs>